Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship everyone on this second Sunday in the season of Lent. We'll begin with our confession and forgiveness printed in your bulletin or on the screen. I invite you to stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another in this time of silence. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only known to you, forgive us, Lord. Amen. My friends, here is the flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us and breaks every snare of sin washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing our gathering hymn. You may be seated. We continue with our ceremony for the uh, diminishing candles. And what we'll do is we'll uh, extinguish a candle, one for each Sunday as we go through the season of Lent, uh, to remind ourselves how not only the people back then, but we today uh, snuff out the light of Christ uh, in our sins. So today, the second Sunday of Lent, We remember the events that led up to the crucifixion. Jesus had come to bring hope and light to the world, but at every step there were those who willingly tried to put out that light. He brought grace and forgiveness, but these gifts were often rejected by those filled with hatred and fear. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, the 12th chapter, that it was the Sabbath and Jesus went into a synagogue where there was a man with a paralyzed hand. Some people were there who wanted to accuse Jesus of doing wrong. So they asked him, is it against the law to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, what if one of you had a sheep and it falls into a deep hole on the Sabbath? Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? And a man is worth so much more than a sheep. So then, our law does allow us to help someone on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the man with the paralyzed hand, stretch out your hand. The man stretched out his hand, and it became well again. 
just like the other one. Then the Pharisees left, and they made plans to kill Jesus. Even when Jesus was healing, there were those who could not accept the power and mercy of God. As the Pharisees left to make plans to kill Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, a little more of the light which had come into the world was snuffed out by people Jesus had come to save. We sing verse 2 of our hymn. And together, let's pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thanks to our choir for their song today.
Thank you, choir. At this time, we'll sing Jesus Loves Me, and the kids are invited forward for the kids' message. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? Are you okay? Oh, buddy. I have two boxes here this morning. And I, so this one, look, uh, I accidentally stepped on it in my office. I don't know if you've seen my office. It's a little messy, so I, yeah. Oops. Um, but I also have this box that is nicely wrapped. Very, very pretty box. Which, which box do you think we should open this morning? You want to open the present? All right, let's see what's in it. Do you think it's something good? You think it's something good? All right, let's find out in here. What is it? Recycling papers! Woohoo! Is that good? Are you excited? Is that a fun thing to find in a pretty box? No. No, no not very exciting. Let's try this one. Bad shaped boxes are good things. Bad shaped boxes are good things? Well, I guess we'll find out, won't we? What's in here? Stickers! Does everybody want to take a heart sticker? That's more exciting than recycling papers, isn't it? Everybody get one who wants one? There we go. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily what you expect. You expect the nice box, I guess unless you're Philip, you expect the nice box to have something nice, and you expect the box is kind of beat up and has a hole in it and got stepped on that it would be, you know, something that you wouldn't want to keep. Like maybe you'd put your recycle papers in a box that you're going to recycle. Um, in our story today, we hear Jesus telling the disciples about how he's going to go to the cross and die. And they were so surprised. It would have been like opening up this battered box and finding good news. They were expecting, their, following Jesus, they were expecting it to look like this, a pretty box with wonderful things in it. And they open it up and instead of wonderful things, they find this news that Jesus is going to die. And they're kind of upset and they're stressed about it. They don't want Jesus to die. But Jesus eventually helps them to learn um, that him going to the cross is actually good news for all of us. Uh, because Jesus dies on the cross, but what happens after that? Do you remember? He raises from the dead. He doesn't stay dead. So even though it might seem like the news that he's going to die is a box like this full of full of scary bad news, they open it up, and what's inside? God's love for us that I represented with these heart stickers. That even though it seems like really hard, bad, scary news that Jesus is going to die, in the end, it's a way that Jesus shows really big, great love for us. Um, so when you hear that in the story that the disciples are expecting something completely different, you can think about how God's love shows up even in places we don't expect. Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, thank you for giving us your love in unexpected places. Help us to share that love with all your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. You can head on back to your seats, and we will hear the word of the Lord. And I'm going to pick up my recycle papers.
Our first reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 17. When Abraham, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make a covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. King of peoples will come from her. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is taken from Romans 4, verses 13 to 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offsprings received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through the unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised the Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Here ends the second re reading. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for our gospel verse. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus began to teach them.
that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Do you know what sounds like a really excellent idea? Going camping with your kids. That's right, it sounds amazing. Fun bonding time together as a family, sharing an activity that you enjoy. I mean, I grew up camping and it was wonderful, so share it with my family. You imagine camping, watching the stars, sitting around, having a campfire and roasting s'mores going for hikes, learning about nature, exploring the outdoors, learning new things like setting up tents and cooking over a fire, and then getting to just be loud and wild outside, burn off all that energy so they sleep at night. Camping with your kids sounds great. I think the disciples felt the same way about following Jesus. It sounds great. I told you a couple weeks ago in my sermon about how at the time, the opportunity to follow a rabbi was a prestigious achievement that very few people in the ancient world had access to. So the disciples would have followed Jesus thinking it was going to be great. I imagine they were picturing things like earning prestige and respect from others thinking they would learn about their faith and be able to inspire and grow and share with others. I think they imagined becoming teachers themselves, making a difference in their own family's social and economic status. They imagined the, how great it would be to travel to new places they'd never been to, to make new friends, to make a positive impact on the world. And if anything else, it would just be better than the manual labor or tax collecting or fishing. Of course, much of this is my own imagination about what the disciples would hope and dream, but I think it's safe to assume that they thought it was going to be great. Now, I think you all know where I'm going this, with this, right? That things that sound great are not always actually great, right? Camping with your kids, for example, it sounds great and fun, but it's not always quite the Instagram-worthy outing as you would imagine when you concoct the idea. Because the reality of camping with kids is, in my experience, a little bit more like this. The kids will whine and whine and whine and get in the way while you're trying to set up a tent and making a meal. And making a meal takes twice as long camping as it does at home. And the kids are twice as hungry and whiny and crabby as they usually are at home. And then, after that long-awaited meal finally comes to them, half of it will end up in the dirt. And while at home, if they drop it, you can maybe just eat it off the floor. You can't do that when you've dropped it in the dirt. When you're camping with your kids, they are in constant danger of getting hurt, of touching poison ivy, of breaking something, or getting their last clean set of clothes irreparably dirty or torn or muddy. 
Well, it seems like they should be able to be loud and wild. In reality, there are people at the campsites next door to you, and you can't be too loud because those people at the next door campsites will give you dirty looks while simultaneously playing loud music until 10 p.m. so you can't sleep. There are bugs. There's poison ivy. There are bugs. It's dirty. There are bugs. Kids get tree sap in their hair. True story from our camping trips. There are bugs. And then there's complaining about the bugs. You can't forget about that. They'll drop a hot dog in the fire. They'll drop a s'more in the fire. They'll also drop your phone in the fire. Why do they have your phone? I don't know. Camping with kids is hard. It can certainly be worth it. There are lots of wonderful and good reasons why you should still go camping with your kids, even when there are lots of challenges. Just don't expect it to be, like, relaxing. <laughs> But the one thing I can tell you is that camping with your kids will not be as great as it sounds. And I think the same principle applies to the disciples who are following Jesus. They were expecting it to be great, and it was different than they expected. I mean, up until this point, up to chapter 8 in the book of Mark, things were going, like, okay with them following Jesus. Maybe not a fairy tale, but, like, pretty good. So up to this point in Mark, they'd been called to follow Jesus. They went around finding more disciples. They were teaching everywhere. They were healing people. They were casting out demons. There were crowds that were following Jesus, excited and interested. Jesus was doing miracles left and right, feeding the multitudes three different times so far in the book of Mark. Jesus has fed like thousands of people at a time. He's been walking on water. He's been telling stories and parables. Jesus has even given the disciples themselves power and responsibility to go out in pairs to do healings themselves. This had been a big deal. I mean, there had certainly been challenges as well with following Jesus. Like just recently when he taught in his hometown of Nazareth and the crowd got so upset that they tried to throw him off a cliff, but, you know, he escaped. It was fine. And then there was a the horrible incident with uh, John the Baptist dying, but we don't, you don't talk about that one. And then there were quite a few times for the disciples where it was just confusing and they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. But, but overall, following Jesus up to this point was still good and wonderful and special and an honor and overall great. And then we come here to this passage in Mark 8. As the disciples are coming to a face to face with the reality that camping with kids isn't all that fun. The reality that following Jesus means not just to follow a rabbi, but to follow the son of God. And that reality crashes down around them because Jesus tells them he's going to suffer. Jesus tells them he's going to be rejected and he's going to die. And they're sitting here thinking that following Jesus is going to be great. And so they don't want to hear about how not great it's going to become. They've been having a great time learning and teaching and healing and people following them. And they just want to be near them. And Jesus goes and predicts his death, dire and awful things. So hearing this, Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. And... So we don't hear exactly, exactly what Peter says to Jesus, but I imagine it goes something like this. Peter says, hey, Jesus, you can't say things like this. And Jesus says, what things? Peter says, that you're going to die. And Jesus says, why not? It's true. And Peter says, but you're the son of God. The son of God can't die. And Jesus says, actually, the son of God has to die. And then Peter goes, we're trying to start a movement here, Jesus. You are totally undermining it by saying that the leader of the movement will die. And Jesus says, the people who make me suffer are ruining it, not me. And then Peter says, well, maybe let's just cast a more uplifting vision for the people then. How about that, right? Get more people on board. Let's put the doom and gloom away and just, you know, leave it there. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And then Peter goes, whoa, bit of an overreaction there, Jesus. I'm on your side clearly just conjecture. They have a hard time hearing this story of Jesus telling them he's going to die. 
As a pastor, I've walked with many families through the dying process with a loved one. Well, even when someone is very elderly and sick, and we know they're not going to get better, sometimes some families have a really hard time coming to terms with the fact that their loved one is going to die. The families can act as if everything is normal. They try to come up with wild treatment plans. They want to fight and fight because they love this person so much and it is completely painful to even think about losing them. Even though they know in their heart of hearts, it's hard to acknowledge when death is on the horizon. So Jesus is here trying to help the disciples step into the dying process with him. They don't want to talk about it. It isn't fun. It isn't pleasant. It doesn't fit into the narrative they have for him coming to save the world and set it free. And we do the same thing. Struggling to see the reality that is behind the pretty expectations that we've painted for ourselves and our faith. So today I want to challenge you to hear Jesus' foretelling of his death. And I want that to help you face whatever hard realities are in your own life here today. In the season of Lent, we journey towards the cross. And our candle liturgy that we've been doing gives us this image of walking one extinguished candle closer to Jesus' death each Sunday. So as you imagine yourself to face the realities of your own life, you can imagine you're walking with Jesus on that path towards his death, but also on that path towards the life that lies belong it. So walk towards the next stage of life or illness. Walk towards the end of the relationship, even if it's hard to let go. Walk towards a tough decision that needs to be made. Walk towards the darkness of the tomb. Today, I invite you to go camping with your kids. And by that, I mean follow Jesus, knowing that it's not going to be great and picture perfect like we expect. That it sounds fun. And while there will be fun parts, it will also be hard and exhausting and messy and maybe even scary. But follow Jesus to the tomb because it won't quite be what we expect. We'll find out on Easter morning that in fact, it will be even better. Amen. Let's join in our hymn of the day, Will You Come and Follow Me, number 798. Um, this hymn... Um, really touches on the themes in our gospel reading that I didn't specifically preach about, where Jesus calls us that we all are supposed to take up our own cross and follow. So let's sing.
I invite you to stand for the prayers. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, we pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Lord, we turn to you for meaning. Nurture in your children the gifts of the Spirit poured out in baptism, and let the mind of Christ guide your church. Give wisdom and discernment to our leaders, our bishops, pastors, deacons, teachers, lay leaders. Lord, in your mercy. Well, God, we turn to you for renewal. Save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution and changing climate. Cleanse the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests and deserts and wildlife. That generations to come may cherish your creation. Grant weather that is good for land, people, and creatures. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, God, we turn to you for justice. So uphold the worth and dignity of every person, especially any who experience hatred and rejection. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Lord, we turn to you for healing. Send compassionate helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people. Befriend those who are lonely. Bring hope to any in despair, and console the bereaved. Feed the hungry people living in food deserts and protect any at risk from exploitation and abuse. Healing Lord, we pray for Kayla and Deb Bolton, LaVon Hansen and Rick Hansen. We pray for Dick Oski, Frank. Healing upon Colleen Thompson and Claire Baum, Braxton Wolfred, Marjorie Chesney, and at Root Prairie, we lift up to you Tilford Rain and Dick Fuller, Jada Brunau, Rachel Gens, Diana Eikhoff. We pray, Lord, for the Hostchild family and my relatives as we grieve the death of my dad. And for all those whose names are upon our hearts in this time of silence. Grant health and wholeness, peace and joy, strength and hope. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we turn to you for a purpose. Remind us of your faithfulness to this congregation and increase our trust in your guidance and keep us near the cross. Grant that our acts of service will express Christ's sacrificial love in our lives. Make us bold and creative in sharing your love and your word. Lord, in your mercy. Accompany on us our journey, O God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share the peace with one another. We are in the season of Lent, and so we continue our Wednesday night services. Uh, the theme is the secret of forgiveness. So we'll continue this Wednesday, 7 o'clock is worship, using Holden Evening Prayer, which is a beautiful service. And of course, before that, all the fellowship and good food and the fellowship hall as we begin our suppers at 5.30. And uh, I invite all of you to be, uh, be a part of those wonderful evenings. Minnesota Food Share Month begins next week in March and throughout the, the, the month of March. And I challenge our congregation uh, to uh, support that as much as possible. There's such uh, food insecurity in our community. And uh, uh, whatever we can bring uh, in food or uh, monetary donations beginning next Sunday will be great. There will be a display right there in the gathering area uh, for that. Uh, Pastor Nissa, I believe the Quick Trip fundraiser, Quick Trip card fundraiser continues, and the Narthex for those going on this summer trip. Are there any other announcements? If not, let's receive today's offering.
Let us pray. Lord God, we give unto you what you have first given to us, ourselves, our time, our treasures, all signs of your gracious love for us. As you have sacrificed your life for us, we live our lives not only for ourselves, but for others as well. We pray this in your loving name. Amen. And together we pray the, Lord, the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Let's sing Beneath the Cross of Jesus.